Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's service of worship today on the 7th of March 2021. It has been a rough winter for many of us, but the tiny bit of good weather during the last week certainly has helped to lift some of our spirits and remind us that spring is just around the corner. And just like the seasons will always come around and never fail, remember God's love also never fails. I just have one announcement this week, that is that the midweek is on on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock on Zoom. Here are the details you need. The meeting ID is 751-337-2776 and the password is PRAYER with a capital P. If you're calling on the phone, the phone number is 020-3901-7895. The meeting ID is the same, 751-337-2776. And the password is 436346. Our call to worship is taken from Lamentations chapter 3, and it says this Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let us worship the Lord then as we pray to him now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, because of your great love for us, that immense, powerful, all-encompassing love for us, that never-failing, never-ending, enduring love for us, because of that love for us, we are not consumed. Because your compassion is as unfailing as your love, your compassions never fail us. They are new every morning. Each and every day we rise we get to experience your compassion and your love because your faithfulness is great. For had you not loved us, had you not been compassionate to us, had you not been faithful to us, despite our unfaithfulness to you, we would certainly be consumed, consumed by your wrath. Your wrath is all that we deserve. And yet you redirected that wrath onto your own son, Jesus Christ, so that we could escape it. Your compassion for us was so great. Your love for us was so great that you inflicted our punishment onto your own son so that we could go free. Great is your faithfulness. And Father, you have been faithful to us throughout these last few months, this last year as well. While it has been tough for so many of us, you have remained faithful because your faithfulness is great and perfect. You have walked beside us. You have been near to us, regardless of whether or not we feel it. You have been leading and guiding your people through these dark days because you have promised to do so, because you are the good shepherd. And when we walk through these dark valleys, we do not need to fear any evil, for you are with us. May we take hold of that now, as we brace ourselves for a few more weeks of restriction, Bring us out of this lockdown stronger than ever and closer to Jesus than we ever have been. Protect us and deliver us, we pray. For great is your faithfulness, your compassion and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Bible reading is taken from Matthew 26, starting at verse 17. This is the word of the Lord, which says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. 
The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. And we ended there at verse 35, knowing as always that the Lord does and will bless the reading of his word. Amen. Boys and girls, good morning. Welcome to March. Isn't it great that Easter holidays are only a few weeks away? Woohoo! No more homeschool for a couple of weeks. And then, hopefully, no more homeschool. Never! <laughs> yes! I love homeschool. Boys and girls, it's coming up to Easter, and I thought I'd tell you a wee story about Easter, because sometimes I think that maybe you know some of these stories, but maybe you don't know all of the stories around Easter or in the Bible. So I'm going to tell you one of the things that happened at Easter. Jesus had 12 followers. Hi! Hello! Hello! Hey. Hello. Hi! Friends. We call them the disciples. One of them was a man called Judas Iscariot. Hello. And he was angry with Jesus. Arr. And he betrayed Jesus. He sold Jesus out to the leaders of the time so that they would arrest him. And they wanted to kill Jesus. And that's how he ended up on the cross. Judas let Jesus down. But Judas wasn't the only one who let Jesus down. The rest of the disciples, when Jesus got arrested, ran away. Run away. Hi. Run away. Hi. One of them, called Peter, said he didn't know Jesus. Jesus who? Never heard of him. Never seen him before in my life. So boys and girls, Judas. Jesus' friend let him down, betrayed him, sold him out. And as a result, Jesus ended up on the cross and he died. But Jesus knew that was going to happen. He knew why he was on earth. He knew he was going to die because he died for a reason, to pay the price for my sin and for your sin if you trust in Jesus. He paid the price for sin. That was all part of the plan. But at the same time, his friends still let him down. And all the other friends, the other disciples, they let him down too. One of them even said, I don't know who he is. Boys and girls, has your friend ever let you down? Do you ever have a friend who's maybe done something and you thought they were going to do something better than what they did and they ended up letting you down? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. It's happened to me a few times. I think it happens to all of us. If that ever happens to you, boys and girls, remember, 
Jesus, friends, all of them, let him die as well. But Jesus still loved them. Jesus still went to the cross and died for them. So maybe, boys and girls, when someone lets you down, one of your friends let you down, maybe we should follow his example. And also, let it go. Forgive them. Love them. What do you think? Maybe the grown-ups should maybe listen to this as well, because when you're older, it's very hard. It becomes a lot harder to forgive someone when they let you down. It's very hard to keep on loving someone when they let you down. Maybe we should all follow Jesus' example and forgive people when they let us down. Because they're always going to let us down. People are always going to let us down. Boys and girls, remember this. Because we're all we're all human. We all make mistakes. We all let each other down. You're going to let people down too. The point is to try to be like Jesus and love them anyway and forgive them because Jesus did the same with us. He loves us and he forgives us if we ask him to. That was the point of Easter, boys and girls. Jesus had to die because his death paid the price for our sin. And that's why we celebrate Easter. Boys and girls, I hope you have a great week and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. As we approach Easter, we're going to look at a mini-series, which I've entitled Journey to the Cross. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one with a similar title. Today is part one, and the subtitle is Fighting Around the Table. Like in many modern-day families, I'm sure mealtimes can be fraught with disaster. Teenagers barely saying a word, never looking up from their phone, giving you that look when you ask them to put their phone away. Arguments often happen around the table because so often that's one of the few times the family is together. <laughs> Don't you just love mealtimes? I'm never a fan of arguments at the best of times, but especially at mealtimes because I love my food and I want the dining experience to be awesome so that I can enjoy my food even more. And so I never want to have a family feud disturbing my eating experience. Well, today we're looking at the fight around the table of the Passover, the Last Supper, the meal that Jesus took before he was arrested and taken to be crucified. And this family feud, so to speak, kind of spoils the meal, as Tom Wright points out. This meal is something that we celebrate throughout the year. The Lord's Supper is a special, holy sacrament. And yet when you look at the original one, there was a lot of tension. There was a lot of fighting. It wasn't a happy time. But then again, you could be forgiven for it not being happy. But it wasn't eaten with quiet contemplation or silent meditation. All hell broke loose at the table. Or should I say, hell was about to break loose. Literally. It starts off with Jesus dropping the bombshell in verse 21 as they're sitting there eating away. Things are looking good. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And I can imagine half of them choking on their lamb kebab. Just picture that. Silence as they eat, maybe a little light conversation. Next thing Jesus opens his mouth and says, Oh, by the way, one of you is going to betray me. <coughs> Say what? Now this announcement really affected the mood of the night. And the disciples then ask, in turn, well, surely it's not me. Verse 22, they were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. And Jesus responds in the next verse. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Now the Passover consists of bitter herbs along with the unleavened bread and the lamb. And in order to lessen the bitterness of the herbs, there was a dip in a bowl that people would share. And the sharing of this dip is an intimate thing. Everyone is dipping their hands into this bowl. 
And Jesus' point is this, the one who will betray me is someone very close to me, one of my intimate friends, someone who says they know me. And then he continues, the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. So whoever will betray Jesus is someone close to Jesus, someone who knows him intimately, and yet someone who does not love him. They know him, they know all about him, but they don't love him. And this person will suffer grave punishment for his betrayal. It would have been better if this person had not been born. But since they were born, there is an eternal destiny of punishment waiting for that person. And so it would have been better had they not been born. So Jesus would be betrayed by one of his intimate followers. Then Judas speaks up, verse 25. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. Judas is someone who followed Jesus everywhere. He was considered as one of the twelve disciples. He was listed as one of the twelve. You can't get closer to Jesus than that. Judas knew Jesus just as much as the others. But when the others said, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Judas said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Did you see the difference there? The rest of them call him Lord. Judas calls him teacher. That's what rabbi means, teacher. Judas knew Jesus, but he didn't love him. And yet Judas, despite looking like a disciple, was no more a disciple of Jesus than Satan himself. All Judas did was go through the motions. He looked good. He did good stuff with Jesus, but he did not love Jesus. And Jesus warned him what was in store for him, something so horrific it would have been better if he'd not been born. You know, it pains me. It really pains me when I see people attending church who aren't saved, who haven't made that commitment to Jesus. It really pains me when I see people or hear of people who have been faithful to coming to church. They come every week. They maybe even get involved. They maybe even give to the church. They maybe help decorate the church at harvest or something like that. Like they're, They go to the church a lot. They're all about the church, but they haven't put their faith in Jesus. They know Jesus. Well, actually, they know about Jesus. They don't really know him, and they certainly don't love Jesus. They haven't trusted in Christ. They look like a Christian, like Judas looked like a Christian, but they are no more a Christian than Satan himself. And the plain truth is that unless they repent and turn to Christ, it would have been better for that person to have never been born because the future for them is one of horrific, eternal torment. And that pains me because I don't want to see anyone go through that, especially when some of these people actually think that they'll get to experience eternal life because of their deeds, because they decorate the church at harvest time or whatever it is. And they're so wrong. But there's hope. There's hope. There was hope around the table that night. Because the scene continues. The Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, is celebrated where Jesus signifies that this wine represents the blood of a new covenant, a new promise that God is making with us. And Jesus' blood is the seal of that new covenant. And by drinking this wine around the table that night, the disciples were celebrating in this new covenant that God will make with them through Jesus. And what is this new covenant? It is that through their faith in Jesus Christ, this future horrific eternal torment can be replaced with a future of peace and blessing and eternal life in paradise. But it required Jesus to suffer that horrific punishment in their place. Jesus knew what was ahead of him. He was going to the cross for a reason. It was for those very people who were sitting around him. People who were sinners in need of a saviour. And Jesus stepped in to be that saviour for them. And he was set on going to the cross to take their sin on himself and to endure that horrific punishment 
for them. Their horrific punishments he was going to take on himself. And they certainly didn't realize it then. And they certainly didn't deserve it. Because the scene continues. Even though they hear this sorrowful news about betrayal, they sing a hymn, which seems strange. However, despite our sorrow and misery, we must still worship the Lord. But you might think things have calmed down a little. But then Jesus opens his mouth again and drops another bombshell. Oh, by the way, it's not just Judas who will betray me. You're all going to fall away because of me tonight. Verse 31. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But notice what this means. Judas has been outed as the traitor. And so the rest of them might be thinking, well, should have known. There was always something about that guy. At least I'm okay. I'm glad I'm a decent person who wouldn't do something like that to my Lord. And whether or not they thought that is unknown, but just in case they did think that they were okay, that they were good, decent people, Jesus comes down on them as if to say, guys, don't be thinking you're perfect because you're not the one going to betray me. I mean, you guys do know me and love me, but you're all going to disown me. Which heightens the fact that Jesus was going to the cross for all of these people because all of them were going to disown him. All of the people around that table needed a saviour. And yet Jesus said this a few chapters earlier in Matthew 10. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. And so if it wasn't for God's grace, these guys would be doomed. But Jesus went to the cross for all these people who needed saved. But the sting is that nobody deserved the salvation. Nobody was good enough. There was not one person around that table that didn't need Jesus' sacrifice. And from what we know about Judas, perhaps the one who thought that he was good enough was the one person for whom Jesus didn't die. He was the one person for whom Jesus didn't pay the price of their horrific torment. He was the one person around that table whose sins Jesus did not pay the price for. And he was going to be lost eternally, paying for his own sin for all eternity. And it would have been better off for him had he not been born. But just in case you think you're okay, that you wouldn't do something like this, well, we have Peter. He also thought that. Verse 33. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Okay, Jesus, they might fall away. I mean, I can see that, but not me. I'm with you to the end, Jesus. Oh, really? Verse 34. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. And as we know, he did just that. The man who was passionate about Jesus, who loved him, denied him three times. He let him down as well. And Jesus foretold Judas's betrayal. He foretold the disciples' disowning of Jesus. And he foretold Peter's denial of him. Why? How? Because Jesus knows all about us, everything we've done and everything we will do. And so we have Judas, who looked the part, did all the right things, was so concerned about the poor although he was dipping his hand into the money bag. But he looked apart, did all the right things, said all the right things, but he was no more a disciple than Satan himself. But we also have Peter, who was hot-headed, impetuous, opened his mouth before thinking about it. But he loved Jesus. Despite all his imperfections, he loved Jesus. So we have Judas, who followed Jesus but didn't love him. And we have Peter, who also followed Jesus but who did love him. Both of them let Jesus down, big time. And Jesus knew they would, but only one was saved. Don't let that go unnoticed. Jesus knew that both of these men would let him down, but he still went to the cross to save one of them. Had Judas repented, he would have saved him too, but Judas didn't repent. 
Both of them let Jesus down, but there was hope for Peter. And we see that after Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus meets Peter on the beach and he asks three times, one for each denial, Peter, do you love me? And Peter does love Jesus. And he becomes the rock on which Jesus would build his church. Judas hanged himself. He took justice into his own hands. And it would have been better for him had he not been born. Peter, in repentance, accepts Jesus' grace and forgiveness. And his faith in his Lord saves him from the punishment that Judas is currently suffering right now and will suffer forever. So around this table of the Passover, the Last Supper, it was not all holy and calm. As we've seen, there were a lot of emotions running high. There were a lot of truths thrown out, a lot of hard things to hear. Jesus is telling everyone, you're going to let me down in one way or another. But right in the middle of it was Jesus offering his grace for all of those who would let him down. Right in the middle of it was Jesus inaugurating his new covenant, his promise of salvation to anyone who would believe in him and love him. In the middle of the emotion, the hurt of accusation, perhaps the offence that was taken, how could Jesus say I would do that? In the middle of all of this, we have the central truth that Jesus' blood signs a new covenant with us, a covenant of grace, that his death would serve to pay the price for all of those people in that room who love Jesus and put their faith in him. That his shed blood ratifies this new covenant and extends it to us too. That's right to you and me. To anyone who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. To anyone who loves Jesus. These people needed to hear that they were going to let their friend down. They needed to hear that they were not perfect. Otherwise they would not really know their need for their salvation. And they did need salvation. Everyone needs salvation. They walked with Jesus. They talked with him. They followed him. But so did Judas. Playing the part, looking the part, walking the walk, talking the talk, doesn't cut it. They needed to hear that they would also let Jesus down so that they would be under no illusion that they were good people. But also so that they would fully accept the grace that he offered to them. And we need to hear that too. As painful as it sounds, as affronted as we might feel when we're told this news that you and I will let Jesus down, probably later on today, if you haven't already, as affronted as you might be with that news that you're not perfect, that you're a sinner, it's what we need to hear. Because if we don't hear it, then we might think we're okay. And if we think we're okay, then we won't fully accept the grace that Jesus offers. In order to fully accept Jesus' grace, we need to be fully aware that we are not okay. That we let Jesus down all the time and we have nothing good to offer him. But it doesn't end there. To all those people who would disown Jesus, who would fall away. For Peter, who would deny him not once, not twice, but three times. To everyone watching this, who lets Jesus down but has put their faith in him. Jesus went to the cross and he shed his blood, knowing full well that we would let him down. Jesus knew the disciples would let him down, but he went to the cross and paid the price for their sin regardless. Jesus knew that I would let him down, but he went to the cross anyway and paid for my sin regardless. Jesus knew that you would let him down every day. But Jesus also went to the cross, but he only pays the price for your sin if you put your trust in him and put your faith in him to forgive you. If you're like Judas, and you haven't put your faith in Christ, then he didn't pay the price for your sin. And it would have been better if you'd never have been born. And you're no more a Christian than Satan himself. Don't be like Judas. Surrender your life to Jesus, who went to the cross to pay the price of sin exactly for those who would let him down, but only for those who acknowledge their sin, who realize that they're not perfect, and accept his grace and put their faith and trust in Jesus to save them. Put your faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross right now and enter into this new eternal life right now. But for everyone else, for all of us who do love Jesus, but we're making a dog's dinner of following him like Peter did, remember that Jesus went to the cross for you. 
that he has paid the price of your sin. And as he hung there on the cross, he was taking all your sin onto himself. All your sin, past, present and future, he was taking it on himself. He was taking all your guilt on himself. So you don't have to feel guilty anymore. He was taking all your shame on himself. For all those times you let him down, he was taking it on himself. And so you don't need to feel ashamed anymore either. But on the cross, he paid the price for your sin. He's paid the price for you letting him down. He's forgiven each and every time we drop the ball and mess up. And so we stand before the Father forgiven, with no more guilt, no more shame. Even though we're going to let him down again, we still stand forgiven, guiltless, shameless. And Jesus stands with all our guilt, all our shame, all all our sin on him. Just remember Peter, who let Jesus down big time. Grace is us getting blessing when we deserve punishment. Remember that. We didn't get what we deserved. Instead, Jesus got what he didn't deserve so that we could get what we didn't deserve. And so those in the church are like Judas or Peter. We either know Jesus and love him or we just know about Jesus. Jesus is either our Lord or he's just a teacher. Either we walk with the Lord and look the part, looking like a Christian, but no more a Christian than Satan himself, or we're like Peter. And while we might look like a Christian, because we are, we're also fully aware that we are a failure in many ways, letting Jesus down all the time, maybe feeling shame that we don't look particularly well as a Christian. But we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, but we're struggling through what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's Peter. Peter was saved, forgiven, and Jesus used him to build his church. Same goes for you too. Judas, well, it would have been better for him had he not been born. Jesus only paid the price for one of these people. For one, it would have been better had he not been born. For the other, he was reborn. And what a glorious day it was when he entered into this eternal life with his sin paid for and his guilt and shame removed. And that's the same for anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So the call is simple. We all let Jesus down. We all will let Jesus down. We all have let Jesus down by our thoughts, by our deeds, by what we've done, by what we haven't done. None of us is without sin. Like none of the disciples were safe around that table. But Jesus went to the cross anyway to pay the price for their sin and to offer them the grace of eternal life. So trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ to free you from your sin and your guilt and your shame. And when you let Jesus down again, remember the story of Peter and know that nothing can pluck you out of his hands. And next time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, remember that in the middle of the distraction around that table, we have Jesus who was inaugurating his new covenant with us through his shed blood, which forgives us for all the times we let him down, day in, day out. Let's acknowledge our sin and failure before him now. He knows all about us. And let Jesus cleanse us and free us from our guilt and our shame. We might let Jesus down. So did his disciples. So did Peter. So did Judas. But the difference is that Peter and the disciples had faith in Jesus. They loved him. They acknowledged their sin. They repented. Judas didn't. So for people like Judas, if you're not going to repent, then it would be better for you had you not been born. For people like Peter and the rest of the disciples who love Jesus, who put their faith in him, but they're struggling with it all, don't worry. They're in good hands. The disciples were like that too. It's fallen the grace of Jesus to forgive us and to pick us up and help us on our way in our road of discipleship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus that he went to the cross, that he took our shame and guilt and our sin on himself so that we could go free. Thank you that he knows that we're going to let him down, that we do let him down, that we do sin every day. He knows all about us inside and out. He knows the worst of us. But he still loves us and he still paid for our sin regardless. 
Help us to remember that every time we let him down, that he still loves us, that he offers us his grace each and every day. May we take that and may we use that knowledge to spur us on to be better disciples, to grow deeper in our faith and our love for Jesus. This is our prayer and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.